Hey guys, uh, so welcome to the fifth uh, SJ Game Design Meetup. Thank you all for coming. Uh, without much ado, uh, this is Paul Coleman, uh, and he's going to be giving us a talk about his, uh, the lessons he's learned over the course of his career. Paul has just uh, joined Nordius as uh, the new creative director. Um, so, without much more to say. Cool, so thank guys. you. Thank you, Ash. So, um, I'm Paul Coleman. Um, I actually joined Nordius at the end of June, uh, so I've been here for a relatively okay summer. I've, I've heard it's not been quite as hot as some people uh, have uh, led me to believe, but I found it pretty hot compared to the UK. Um, and now the weather's kind of turning a bit more UK-like, so I'm starting to feel more and more like I'm at home. Um, what I want to talk to you guys today about is uh, how I got into games, um, what I've done during my career, some of the successes I've had, uh, which are always cool, um, but some of the failures I've had and the lessons that I've kind of learned from those so that I can hopefully impart some advice um, and, and give you some kind of uh, meaning to how you can potentially avoid some of the pitfalls that I've fallen into. So, um, yeah, let's start from the beginning. Um, so, my dad was English. He was born in 1915, so hence the sepia-toned picture. He was pretty old. I was actually uh, probably a mistake. He retired with my mother, who he met in Rome. Um, they worked for the United Nations in Rome, fell in love, um, moved to Suffolk for his retirement, and then I happened to ruin his peaceful life. So, that's me. Um, I was car mad. I don't really know how it happened. My dad was more into bikes. He, he loved his cars, but um, my first word was car. Uh, about the age of three, I could walk down a street of cars and name every single car by not just brand, but the model as well. Um, so I was pretty tedious as a, as a child. Um, but as I developed, I knew that cars had to be a really big, important part of my life. Um, and you know that question you get when you're growing up? It's like, what, do, what are you going to be when you grow up? Well, my answer to that was always, I'm going to be a car designer. That's, that's what I'm going to be. So I was drawing cars all the time, sketching. Um, I actually went to a school a bit like Hogwarts. It's the same school that my father went to back in whenever in history. But the cool thing about this school was it had like an, a quite a big engineering uh, background. So they actually had an automotive engineering department, which was unheard of um, in the British school system. Most places had like crafts and design labs, but they didn't really go as far as actually building and restoring old cars. Um, and every subject I chose at school was, was based around how am I going to become a car designer? How am I going to become a car engineer? So maths, physics, uh, design. I did do some history of art just to kind of take my attention away from that pure focus, but most of it was all about uh, automotive engineering. And um, I did everything that was necessary. I jumped through all the hoops. I got the grades I needed to get um, and went on to university uh, in Coventry, which is a city near Birmingham in the center of the UK. It's pretty renowned for its automotive engineering, so you can see this focus was just getting more and more close to my end goal. When I arrived at university, I then found out that I was nowhere near good enough at mathematics to cope with the level that was required for the standard uh, to graduate from an automotive engineering, engineering degree and then get a job. I think I could have probably scraped through the degree part of it, but I don't think anyone would have employed me because there would have been 10 other graduates that same year who would have been better than me. So um, I... After about nine months, I was floundering so much that I started to, like, my attention started to wane and I started to sort of fade away from interest in the course. I started to flounder quite a lot. Like, the thing that I'd focused my entire life on up to that point was starting to seem impossible. So, um, I actually took the decision to drop out of the course. I went and took a job, um, actually, at a nightclub just kind of promoting a nightclub. It was kind of rubbish, but it paid the bills. Um, and it, it sort of funded me back into another course, which was also not very good. So I spent another nine months 
this course was called Disaster Management. So it was like setting up refugee camps in um, famine and, and war zones. Um, but it, again, sounded great on paper, sounded like something I could get involved in, but I started to kind of lose interest in that. All of this time, I was actually playing more and more computer games with my friends. Um, and so uh, I found out that there was a company about half an hour away from Coventry called Codemasters who were making one of the games that I was playing almost religiously, Colin McRae Rally. And so I started to shift my attention to, well, this is something that I'm spending a lot of time doing and enjoying. How do I get into this as a, as a job? How can I do this as a career? Um, so uh, the final stab at having a degree and actually uh, delivering on the promise I'd kind of made to my parents that I would get through university was um, similar to graphic design, but it had a bit more kind of uh, written word in it. So it was kind of the basis of it was to write te technical manuals. So when you get a computer or a printer, you get an instruction manual with it. That has to be designed and written in a particular way to make it as usable and as clear as possible. That was the kind of, that was the ideal job to get into if you did that course. But it taught me a lot about usability, about design process, about review. And all of those things kind of fed me towards getting a job in games. So I finished university and I did get a degree. Um, and um, so all of that time I was playing many, many games. Here's a few of them. You may recognize some of these. Some of these might be a bit before your time. Quite car focused as you can tell, but there was some some in there, I'll, I'll use the laser pointer because I haven't had one of these before. So Tony Hawk's Pro Skater was just the most amazing game for me. Um, and two just was even better. Uh, Gran Turismo, obviously incredible. Colin McRae, well, we'll talk about that in more detail later on. Driver, a lot of people found this game super hard, but I, I loved it. Um, this was kind of the first RPG I played. I didn't really know what I was doing when I played it, but. I loved the world that you could explore. Um, and actually, this is the sort of game that I quite enjoy playing in my spare time now. And then Battlefield 1942, I almost failed my final degree course playing this because it, like competitive multiplayer um, in a battlefield environment was just so intense and so cool. My friends and I used to take it in turns to just run, run around, fly planes, drive tanks, do whatever you wanted, and it was just such an awesome game. Um, totally sucked single player, but amazing uh, multiplayer. So this, this was kind of my backdrop to why I wanted to get into games. Um, and so um, I applied at Codemasters um, for a games tester job. They had about 50 candidates, and I think they accepted three of us. So I was quite fortunate to get in. I obviously said the right things, did the right things. Um, and so that um, basically opened the door towards um, my career. Before I s talk about that in more detail, w one thing I wanted to touch upon, which is something that I, I've started to realize over the months that I've been here in, in Serbia. Um, when I got into games, my pathway into games was through another uh, course. There was no games design course. There was very little in the way of computer programming for games. It was all graphic design to get into games. or you, you needed a passion in games, but you had to learn your subject elsewhere. And I see parallels here in Serbia where you don't really have any formal games courses yet, or correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels like the people I'm working with here have been engineers. They've been um, designers in other mediums and they've come here because they're driven by a passion for games. And that was actually what made games back in the late 90s and early 2000s quite special because you had people coming together from many, many different disciplines who'd had a lot of experience coming together with a, with a combined passion for the medium that they were making, games. And that led to there being probably more creativity than what I see in, in game studios in the UK, what, where I've just come from. That's people who spent their entire childhood and education trying to get onto a games course. Um, that's um, 
people who've spent all of their spare time playing games because they want to be a games designer, and that's funneled them too early. It's exactly what was happening to me when I was trying to become a car designer. I was funneling myself too soon, and that meant that the other world experiences, those, those things that you take from learning different things and experiencing other mediums were, were less. And so people come in with a huge volume of knowledge in design theory, but the, their sort of world experience is quite limited and they're unable to represent the wider world through their game design because all they're thinking about is that really funneled kind of vision of what game design is and what the perfect game is. So it, it's just something I wanted to, to touch upon here because I see that happening here and it's really exciting to see it happen again. Um, it's one of those things that you think having a formalized structure for games education is a positive thing, and it certainly helps to have an understanding of how to make games, but you do need to keep your avenues open and, and understand the bigger picture of the world around you rather than just focusing in entirely on one subject. So, got my interview. Um, got a temporary job, so I was always on the edge of w was my contract going to be renewed? Um, but this is how it panned out. So I started working right at the tail end of Race Driver. Um, that was the first kind of story-based narrative that Codemasters had done in a, in a racing game. It was the worst story of all time. Basically, you killed my brother, I'm going to avenge you on the racetrack. <laughs> Super terrible. <laughs> but, you know, they tried. It had cutscenes in it. It was, it was okay. But what was cool about this was multiplayer racing on Xbox Live. So that was like quite a big thing. They actually re-released the game with the Xbox Live stuff in it. So that was the first stuff I tested. I then went in to a full game cycle with uh, Race Driver 2, which was the direct sequel to that, where they did a bit less of the cheesy storyline and a bit more of the racing. It was great for me because I loved cars, I loved playing racing games, I was able to put in lots of extra time and effort, do lots of overtime, and it didn't feel like a chore, it felt like I was, I was having fun. And that kind of meant that I was always there, I was always doing the late night test sessions when um, the executives were playing the game for the first time on Xbox Live, they would come online and I'd be w there playing, I still had a session running, so I'd, I was getting to interact with people quite high up in the company, despite the fact that I was absolutely on the bottom rung of the ladder. That then gave me a permanent role. I had a senior um, uh, games testing role on Colin McRae Rally, and then I got an opportunity uh, to become a game designer. And this was something that Codemasters used to do back in the day, where they'd basically go, we've got all of these people, they're clearly intelligent and talented. Let's cherry pick those people from within our own company and build them up to, to a new role and actually teach them on the job. Um, it's something that happens less and less now because you can just pluck someone from another company. We've heard Telltale Games has gone under this week. That means that there's a bunch of super talented, super experienced people that other companies can just go, we'll take you and we'll take you. And so games developers are getting older now um, because there's less need for the fresh talent to come through. That doesn't mean that they can't come through, it's just harder and harder to get in. So this, this classical path of I started testing games and then I became a game designer, that's less available now. That doesn't mean it's not possible, you just have to find your right avenue in. Um, so this game design job wasn't a traditional go and work on this tiny feature and design it and we'll put it into the game if you're lucky. It was actually working in a publishing role. So I would take designs that were coming in from other studios around the company, country that Codemasters were publishing. So that was games that were probably going to come out at a 5 out of 10, 6 out of 10 Metacritic and trying to sort of polish them and shape them into hopefully a 7 or an 8, more likely 7. Worst Worms game ever made. Um, I don't think I'm in the credits, fortunately. Probably the worst Micro Machines game ever made. Unheard of World War II dogfighting game, but that was actually decent. I just don't think anyone played it. Uh, this was like a clicker RTS strategy game that you've probably never heard of. This was technologically pretty advanced. You could put your own music CD into your PlayStation 2 
it would take the music from that CD and then allow you to dance to it by creating step patterns for you to play on a dance mat. Incredible technology, considering that PlayStation 2 had like a memory stick and just total rubbishness, but it didn't really do very well. Um, and then Operation Flashpoint, you may have heard of, kind of war simulation game. Sensible Soccer 2006, that 2006 is really important because Sensible Soccer was an amazing game. Sensible Soccer 2006, mm, not so much. Um, and then uh, I'm sure you're all big fans of cricket here in Serbia, so uh, <laughs> Brian Lara Cricket. That was actually wicked working on that because my, my, that was the first time I did get to do some proper kind of system design that was looking at the stats of all the cricket players in the world, turning that into a spreadsheet so that when people played the game, it, those cricketers were strong in the areas where it said that they were going to be strong. It, it was a cool experience. However, an opportunity arose to do what I really wanted to do, which was to work as a designer on the Colin McRae franchise, the reason I got into games in the first place. So, this is where I talk about my success. Um, I started work on Dirt, which isn't pictured here. It was the first game that wasn't Colin McRae Rally, blah. It was... Colin McRae Rally Dirt, and that then spawned the Dirt part of the franchise. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that when I talk about some of the failures, but that was quite detailed design, so it was like choosing all the driver names, um, vehicle handling, stuff like that. It was quite kind of focused areas of the game that I was working on there. But it was my dream to be a part of the creation of something like that, and it was a fantastic opportunity. I then took a brief sabbatical at Sega, and I'll explain why later on, which isn't pictured here, to make Sega Rally. And then I <laughs> Sega Rally folded, or the studio that made Sega Rally folded, and we got bought by Codemasters again. So I ended up uh, back at Codemasters working on Dirt 2. Um, then Dirt 3, which was my first lead game design role. Uh, so I was senior here, kind of led the online design for that. Uh, lead game designer on, on Dirt 3, and then chief games designer, which is Codemasters equivalent of a game director, creative director for uh, Dirt Rally, and then subsequently Dirt 4, and Dirt Rally 2, which has just been announced yesterday. I did about a year's worth of, of work on that before I moved to Nordius. Um, I've, each of these has sold about two and a half to three million units, which is pretty strong for a rally game. It's a niche of a niche genre, um, and pretty much all of them, everything on this screen certainly has got an 87% Metacritic, which I'm super proud of. It's something that, as a game developer, you can really hold on to. Like, sales are important. They mean a lot because it means that your studio stays afloat. It means the business keeps running, and success is really important, and it, you always should measure your success in how much money you're making from something. But when reviewers and players turn around and say the game that you made is really good and that sort of spreads into people going out and playing it based on the quality of the product, that means a lot as well. So, um, yeah, through all of this I even had an opportunity to become a rally co-driver, um, which I started doing around the end of Dirt 3 and it kind of shaped the vision for Dirt Rally, um, that experience of actually sitting in the car and competing at a national level. Um, in a rally car, going through a forest, like, opened my eyes to what it actually meant to do that sport, and so we were able to kind of simulate and represent the sport a lot more closely. Um, that's obviously more challenging. You can't go out and fight an orc or um, even drive a Formula One car. All of those things are kind of difficult here at Nordius. Um, uh, top 11, a lot of the guys here, they play football, they're not playing at a national level. They, they enjoy football as everyone does. So actually getting to sit in a rally car was, was you know, hugely important for, for opening my eyes to the things that we were missing. And a lot of those things were actually super simple little tweaks that we already had available to us within the engine. We just weren't using the engine to maximize on the potential. So getting that kind of real world experience really helped with that. So as I said, hugely proud of all of these um, amazing experience, really glad that they're on my CV and on my softography, but w 
it's really important to also talk about some of the stuff that happened in the background that was not so good while we were uh, on the road to making these. So the first lesson I want to talk about is this notion of picking your battles. This becomes more important when, you, um, when you're working as a game designer and um, people are giving you feedback on your work. Um, it's probably at its most subjective when you do something like the vehicle handling for a car and you go to someone, here's this car that I've made. Does it drive like the car that you think it should drive like? Bearing in mind that that person has probably never driven that car before in their life. Certainly not competitively. This is a highly likely to be a businessman <laughs> rather than a rally driver. So I'd, I'd created these cars. I'd got feedback from people around the studio who were as passionate about cars as I were. And they were pretty happy with what I'd done. They were really positive about it. I thought I was taking the game in a really good direction. It was not what my executive producer, what my creative director, what my game director wanted from the experience. Now, somewhat naively, um, because I was fresh in the job, I decided, no, I know, I know what's right. I'm going to stick to this and, and see it through. They're, they're wrong, and they'll realize they're wrong eventually. Um, it doesn't work like that. And they <laughs> pretty quickly just gently picked me up and moved me into a level design role and said, you're not, you're not going to do the car handling anymore. I think at the time, I was just like, what? I was just doing what I believed in. Um, the reality of it is that, and in hindsight, you can look back at these things. They were clearly getting a lot of pressure from the publishers, from the business to make a game that was much more casual than the Colin McRae Rally series had been prior to that. And I was fighting directly against that vision that they were trying to hold. Now, they didn't very eloquently describe that vision to me, which is why I felt in my heart of hearts that I should stick to my guns. But it's certainly um, something I learned then the hard way, so much so that I felt so kind of browbeaten by the whole thing that I, I left to go and work at, to work at Sega instead because I felt that my position within the studio was no longer tenable. But it, it's super important as a designer to know your brief. And if you don't know your brief, or you don't fully understand why people are giving you feedback that's contrary to what you believe in, then you need to reach out to those people and get them to explain to you why what you are doing is not meeting their expectations. Have that conversation with them and work with them to arrive at the solution that they're looking for but one that actually still feels right in your heart of hearts. So yeah, it was a hard lesson having to leave the franchise that I'd spent all of this energy to work on because my position was untenable. But that took me to Sega. At the time, this was absolutely horrendous, but looking back on it, it was probably the best experience I had because at Sega, I ended up having a lot more responsibility because the team was smaller. So rather than being focused on very specific elements of the design, I was doing a bit of level design, a bit of car handling design, a bit of overall game design, difficulty balancing, AI. I was kind of like much more in tune with the sort of design that happens here at Nordius, where it's a smaller, tighter team. People have to be multi-skilled and be able to work on many areas simultaneously. Um, so at Sega, there were a number of examples of the team assuming that what was in the build at the time was absolutely placeholder, was not going to be there at the end. We were just, it was there, we were going to change it up at the last minute and it would all suddenly look like a proper Sega front end. That is what the game shipped with. We all thought that was placeholder. We all thought uh, they're, they're going to make that look like a proper Sega Rally front end eventually, but it, that was as tight as it got. And that was, people were whispering amongst themselves, oh, this is placeholder, it's going to change. But nobody ever went up to the UI artist and said, hey, um, when are we swapping out this placeholder asset for, because if somebody had said that to them, they'd have been like, what do you mean? This is, this is final art. Like, this is how we're going to go. And then the conversation would have started and maybe work could have been done to fix it. Um, so yeah, never assume that it's going to be all right in the end because chances are if that assumption's being made by you, it's being made by other people, always ask the question. Always, like, don't 
come in with horribly negative feedback, but always ask the question and, and frame the question well to get that information out of people. Um, another example of this, again at Sega, was the AI and how they ran through the stage. So Sega Rally, you can kind of see it in this uh, screenshot here, it had this awesome tech that hasn't really been done since um, 2007 when this game released, uh, 2006, 2007. But the track would deform as you drove around on it, so the car would actually leave tessellated tire tracks through the stage. That actually meant that because the tech was so good, the game design started getting shaped around that. So instead of being a traditional rally game where you go from point A to point B, take your time, and then move on to the next stage, it sort of necessitated having multiple cars on the track. So you followed in the tire tracks of your opponents, and you got bounced around through those ruts, and you got to see these ruts forming, and it was kind of like the tech forcing the game design a little bit. However, the AI, we'd all worked on racing games in various studios around the world. The AI in most racing studios is set up so that it can deliver a lap time for you, and it will speed up and slow down to match that time that you're expecting it to do. As a game designer, that's great, because you can go, right, most players can do this track in this time, therefore the AI needs to set that time, that's what the difficulty is for this track, that's easy. The person who'd done the AI on this hadn't done it before, and they thought the best way to do it was to wind it up like a toy and just let it go on the start line. It would follow the path around the track, but you had no notion of what time it was going to get to the end of the stage in, other than the performance it had when you wound it up at the start. So we were trying to balance a game around the fact that the track was evolving every time a car drove on it because the tire tracks were making the track different. The fact that there was a crazy human player driving around cutting up the AI and getting in the way or being cut up by the AI. And it was just a, a nightmare. And again, everyone just assumed that the AI would be how they do it in all regular racing games. It wasn't. And it created a, a total headache. In the end, we shipped a game with a, a difficulty curve that was so steep that I've only ever met two people that have beaten the whole game. Uh, and I think one of them is me. <laughs> so um, yeah, it was, it was savage. But um, that is, sometimes you just have to make the best of what you've got. So um, that was Sega Rally. This also happened, <laughs> another thing on Sega Rally. It wasn't a great project. Um, but it also happened again quite recently on Dirt 4. So this is actually about matchmaking. Matchmaking in online games. So when you're developing games and you're developing matchmaking systems, you don't have the player population that you're going to have when the game ships. So it's a very easy assumption to make that things that aren't working very well because there's only four people sat in a room trying a multiplayer feature are going to be fine as soon as that game goes out there and is released to the, to the masses because millions of people are going to be playing it, so players are going to find each other and it'll all be all right. So there's a couple of things to note about this. A, don't ever assume you're making a hit. Of course, we all want to make hugely successful games, but you can't ever assume that. So you have to design around the worst case scenario that there's only ever going to be two or three people playing in multiplayer. The other element of this is maybe it's the way that you've designed your matchmaking <laughs> that is causing players not to be able to find each other. And you really have to both sanity check your own design get a buddy to come in and sanity check your design for you and go through every single possible scenario to ensure that it isn't just the way that the system has been designed that is causing the problem. So this happened with Sega Rally. If you were matchmaking um, and someone else was matchmaking at the same time, cool, you found each other. If you were in a game and somebody else was trying to matchmake, you weren't necessarily racing, but somebody was trying to matchmake, you couldn't find each other. So people just assumed that no one was playing the game online because they weren't seeing each other. And as a result, people never played online because they never saw each other, so they just assumed there was no population. Same happened in Dirt 4. We had a ranked ladder system, and players had to be matchmaking at exactly the same time to find each other. And we sort of saw this happening when we were testing the game uh, in the studio, but we just assumed it was because there was only three or four of us trying to test the feature. And that wasn't the case. When it, when it went out into the wild, we had 
probably 125,000 people playing it in that first week, and they couldn't find each other because it was literally you had to be matchmaking at exactly the same time as somebody else to find them. So yeah, terrible mistake, um, and one that you should never assume everything's going to be all right when it goes out to release. So this one is sort of a counter to that first point that I made about picking your battles, but this is important. I saw this happen many times to other designers through my career, and I, I always thought, oh, I'm, I'm better than that. I'll, I'll never roll over. If I really believe in something, I'm gonna, I'm gonna at least argue the case and see if I can get that point across and, and make sure that my idea sings true. On Dirt 4, I did roll over a little bit. Um, life circumstances, uh, I just had uh, my wife and I had just had our first child, so it was really important for us to keep our job and you know, make sure that the money was coming in. Um, I'd just come off the back of Dirt Rally, a game that I'd poured my absolute heart and soul into. It was my passion project, the game that I'd wanted to make all of my career and finally had the opportunity to do it. And the business turned around to me and said, can you make that game but watered down and kind of not quite as as focused and hardcore as the version of the one that you'd made. And I was like, I can, it won't be as good, but I can do it. But I kind of rolled over and just ended up making that call to just go with it and make something that was easier, that was more generic, that kind of just fitted in their business model better. What that actually meant was that we ended up with a game that was that didn't resonate well with either audience. The hardcore guys didn't like it. The casual people didn't like it. Um, it didn't have enough conviction behind it. The people who were making it didn't believe in it as much as they did with Dirt Rally, and it showed both in the sales of the game and, and the fact that the game just didn't seem to have as much love. So you've got to feel conviction when you're making a game. You've got to believe in what you're making. And sometimes that's really hard. Like if you're being tasked with making a game that you don't necessarily like, and this certainly happens more when you're in a junior role, you still have to kind of find a way to get passionate about it. Um, do research into the subject matter. Try and get in the head of the player who's gonna be playing it and understand what it is that's gonna excite them about that game. Because yeah, it's, if you don't do that, your game will just come over as being mediocre. You know, it's, it's very easy to just kind of roll over and do as you're told um, because it, it's less friction. You basically don't um, get in anyone's way. In fact, in some establishments that I've worked, designers who do that and just do what they're told, just roll over, they are seen as good designers because they don't argue with people. It's easy to have a meeting with them because you can give them a rubbish idea and they'll just go, okay kind of walk off and start making the rubbish idea. I don't think it's good. I think if you don't believe in what you're designing, then um, what's the point? Um, and I think if someone says, I don't like your idea, and you just roll over and you go, okay, that's cool, um, I'll change it, then you have to ask yourself, do you, did you even care about it in the first place? I guess that's one of the things that you should always be asking. So, on that, from a design perspective, even if you don't agree, it's really important for us as designers to try and get to the bottom of why people don't agree with our ideas um, and what alternatives we can come up with with that person uh, or with that group to make sure that we maintain the vision of what we're trying to do but also arrive at an agreement that works for all parties. Um, if they give you really good valid reasons for why something needs to change for a business reason, for a monetization reason, whatever it may be, then, you know, yeah, absolutely, work with them, change it. Um, if you just roll over, you'll end up in a land of mediocrity, like we did with Dirt 4. It reviewed well, but it, we all knew that it was just a bit meh. And that showed in the sales, right? It was like, you can look at how that game sold, and it sold really well based on the hype from the press, and then it just dropped straight away. And if you look at good, successful games that, that resonate well with their audience, they start, they can start actually pretty slow, 
But then as people start talking about how good that game is, you can see the sales pick up and the success grows from there. And people start evangelizing about the product. And, and it works really well that way. So yeah, you need to make games that surprise people, that excite people. Um, and that's what makes a difference nowadays. There's a lot of very average games out there. So you need to find that spark that, that makes a difference and gets in people's heads and really makes them talk passionately about it. I'm sure you've all got games at the moment that you're playing that are so cool that when you meet other people who are interested in games, you're talking about those games and the moments you're having in those games. Spider-Man, I think, is doing that for a lot of people at the moment. Um, I know th there's so many, so many examples, but, but yeah, it's, it's that type of moment that you want to be weaving into the experience that you're creating that genuinely takes people into that other place and, and excites them. So yeah. Um, just want to talk a little bit about the design principles that I believe in. And this is kind of, I haven't really thought of this um, much before I came to Nordius, but then I started putting this presentation together and it's, it was kind of came to this point of what do I actually think my design principles are? Because I've just been doing design on a daily basis and working on a product that I'd always loved and um, it, it felt like that product was me and I, I was that product. So w when I started to sort of think about um, the things that I've learned from those successes and failures that we've talked about, the different methodologies that I've experienced as I've worked in games, be it waterfall, classic horrible waterfall where you start at one point and you going to end at that point, but then inevitably you don't and you end up crunching for another three months to get it finished. Or agile, or supposed agile that wasn't very agile, but said it was agile. All of those things, all of these things I've kind of brought together into what I believe are my three main design principles. So, I believe in fast design, and to be clear, that doesn't mean rushing through design. It just means designing things quickly, maintaining a clear vision, and making sure that you're sticking to a schedule. Um, that ties in quite nicely with efficient design because I think when you're designing quickly, you still have to remember that quality is the most important thing. And that's one of the things that makes um, the best designers out there. It's that ability to go fast, but very high quality designs because those things are the best way to get to a solution and a good solution as quickly as possible. And finally, helpful design. So this is helpful from a making sure that the design is useful and helpful for the person who's going to be implementing it with you. Uh, you can't always like deal with your own um, designs yourself. You have to hand them over to a coder or to an artist. So it's really important that the way that you design your features are helpful and explain the pitfalls and the, the kind of reasoning behind why you need that feature making. But it also needs to be helpful for the end user. So the player who's going to pick up your game and play it, um, they shouldn't have to try and penetrate your thoughts as to why you came up with that idea. It should just be explicit to them through what you play. So I also want to say it's very easy to, to kind of underestimate the value of a good designer. Um, everyone thinks they can be a game designer. And it's a craft that takes a lot of skill takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of insight, but because there's no, even if you have a game design degree, it's not really a tangible qualification. So everyone believes they can be a game designer. Um, I've lost count of the amount of times that I've had a workman come to my house to paint the wall and he's like, oh, what do you do for a living? Yeah, I'm a game designer. He's like, oh, I've got a great idea for a game me. It's like, cool, can you just paint my wall, please? Um, <laughs> But you know, everybody, everybody genuinely thinks they can be a game designer. He might have been an amazing game designer. I don't want to put him down too much. I, you always humor them and listen to their ideas. But it's, it's one of those things where, like a coder, I know that I can't do some of the things that a coder can do in a, in a code base. So I can't walk up to him and go, oh, no, what you should have done was change that to that, and that would have worked better. Um, but they can walk up to me as a designer and go, yeah, your design's not great. I'd have done it this way, and it's like, you're probably right, <laughs> but let's discuss it and work out why you think that and, and get to that point. So yeah, 
um, don't underestimate the value of, of good design. So that's me kind of done for the talking. Thank you very much for listening. Um, maybe you've had some similar experiences early on in your, in your careers um, or even in education that resonate with some of those experiences that I've had. But um, feel free to ask questions about anything, be it from this talk or wider design questions, life questions, um, or share experiences that you've had similar to this. Um, but thank you all so very much for coming and listening to me. I realize this is your spare time, and um, it means a lot that you've, you've all come out to listen. So thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, Paul Coleman, Man of the Hour. You guys, uh, if you have any questions to ask him about your experiences, um, and I feel like your lessons are so valuable. I faced it certainly in my career. Uh, if any of you have any questions about how to deal with those situations, uh, now's the chance. I'm going to throw this box at you for as a question, so you'll have to catch it and then answer it. Is it working? Yeah. So thanks a lot for, for the talk. Um, so you obviously have a lot of mileage. Uh, yeah. You uh, so you can tell from my hair. <laughs> <laughs> and you have your share of uh, successful and less successful projects. But I want to ask you about that p period of nine months working as a promoter, where you like it's easy to look now in hindsight like your your uh, career and say you're successful. But I guess at that time. Like, how are you feeling? Were you, did you lose any hope that things are gonna work out? Or did you always believe in yourself that th things are gonna work out? Or did you just need a time to take and think about it? It's a really good question. I think at the time, I was, I was pretty browbeaten, but I'd always had this sense of just work hard at whatever you're doing. Uh, and this was instilled in me by my father who was like, he was, a very wise and old man as I grew up. So I had this guy at home with me all the time. He didn't have to work anymore. So I had a kind of a rapport with him that was like a level that I don't think many people get to enjoy with their, with their father. Um, but he instilled a lot of um, advice and, and wisdom with me. And one of those things was perseverance. So although I persevered with car design, I did reach that point where it was like, the, I'm just punching a brick wall here and it's not, it's not helping. So while I was working as a promoter in a nightclub, I was there kind of thinking, maybe I can do this long term. Maybe I can get my own nightclub, and maybe I can build this up and, and do something with it. But that was the moment to moment. Um, I think during those nine months, it all started out really well. It was a cool job. You got to basically be in a nightclub. But then the late night started to take a toll. It was like you would get up at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. You would go out promoting the nightclub um, at various venues in the town, trying to get people to actually go. Then you'd go and spend the whole night there making sure that people were happy and the guys in the VIP bar were drinking champagne and it was all kind of like this false life. Go to bed at six o'clock in the morning, wake up at one o'clock in the afternoon again. And I, I don't, although I love the nightlife, I don't think I'm capable of doing that in a, in a long term. So. Um, yeah, I started to fall out of love with that and, and it kind of opened my eyes to the fact that this is not a long-term plan. Um, so yeah, there was, it was a good experience. I'd never really had to be the face of anything before and some of the stuff that I did as a promoter of that nightclub, I've actually taken into promoting video games. So you make a game. Generally nowadays, the press want to speak to a dev. They don't want to speak to a PR person about the game. So it's really important to be able to communicate, to sell without overselling, to talk passionately and, um, and have a conversation with a journalist who is ultimately going to deliver your message to an audience, but do it in a way that's got such good conviction that people are going to go out and buy the game based on what you've said to that journalist. So it, I guess selling snake oil, <laughs> selling... Um, things that people don't really need is a uh, really good practice for selling uh, computer games because fundamentally games are they're a hobby people don't have to play the games that we make 
it's also the coolest thing about games because you're making something that people choose to spend their free time and free money buying and playing. And that, for me, is the best reward for making games because it's knowing that people are doing this out of choice. It's not food. They don't have to have a game. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of, yeah, you, you, it's interesting you've asked me that question because I've never had that kind of connection before, but it, it's, it's true. It probably did help, um, but it was not my long-term plan. At the time, it sort of felt like it might be, and then I fell out of love with it. I have another question. Um, so your title here is a creative director, yeah. but you're a game designer, and I, I think usually uh, senior artists or, or somebody on, on a similar position is a creative director. How does a game designer relate to being a creative director? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question, and job titles get a bit arbitrary within games. Um, we have art directors here, uh, we have creative directors, we have game designers. Um, at other companies I worked at, I was chief game designer, but fundamentally my role here is to maintain the vision of the product that I work on and ensure that not just everyone on the team working with me understands that vision and is working towards it, but also the business understands what that vision is and then ultimately when the game goes public, the public understand what the vision of that game is. So. Um, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Creative director, in, certainly in other industries, is, is a much more artistic role, but we have art directors who do the artistic creative director role here. Thanks a lot. Cool. Okay, I got it. Uh, so, a question here from the perspective of a game designer. Mm -hmm. I mean, working on such a huge project, uh, I can imagine how writing all the details and the documentation can be a difficult thing. So what is your approach in, in, in this kind of situation? How did you get all these details and all this little tedious thing uh, to people to, to, to make it for, for, for the game? Many different approaches. When I first started, we used to write Word documents, which were saved in folders. There was no version history other than a note that you would write at the start of the document that was like, hey, I went into this document and changed this. And like, but you wouldn't even leave a strike through at the bottom of it. You just delete that paragraph and write what you wanted instead. So there was no real tracking to it. Since then, Word documents can be saved on, on Perforce. Um, so you can have a version history to Word documents there. Then we moved on to Confluence, which obviously has the page history, but is more kind of readily available. I actually really like um, user stories. Having a kind of high level pitch to a team who's going to be working on your idea and going, this is, as a designer, I want this feature to do this. And you get them in a room and you basically discuss how that's going to be possible, what elements are going to be required, and then everybody breaks that out into tasks and then they go off and make it. I don't think it's necessarily agile, but it just feels like you are getting the people who are going to ultimately make your design invested into the design process early on. Um, when you write somebody a 150-page design document and go on their desk and go, make that, chances are they're not going to fucking read it. <laughs> and then um, chances are they're going to put their own interpretation on that design anyway. So why not get them in a room and, and talk about it and kind of discuss it and find out what they understand and what they don't understand about it because um, it's very, especially in a big office, it's very easy to go via email, hey, I've just finished the design doc document, can you uh, get right on and make that for me? And then you come back two months later for this massive feature that you'd kind of specced out in its entirety and it's completely different to what you had hoped it would be. So yeah, um, definitely get people invested in your designs as early as possible and check in with them regularly to make sure it's still on track. Because as they work on it, they'll find things that are right and wrong with it, and as long as that conversation is always ongoing, then you've got a really good opportunity to shape something that ultimately will be better than what you would have ended up with if they just followed your design to the letter. Okay, thank you. Cool. Anyone else with a question? He's gonna throw it to you. Very good, back. Hello, Paul. Hi. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on what is the difference uh, between the fast design and the rush design? 
like uh, what mistakes should we avoid in order not to rush it a bit, even if we want to make a very fast design? Yeah, it's a, so I think it's trying to get to the, the purest version of the idea as quickly as possible. So it's rather than getting into details too quickly, you're like, what is the reason for this feature existing? What is the reason for this design existing? And rapidly iterating on that as quickly as possible, and then you can start to flesh it out once you've got something that feels right, that it's very core. Cool. If you just go, here's a cool idea, and then you start fleshing it out, that's a rush design, because you end up, kind of, you can snowball that, what isn't a pure idea, into something that becomes bigger and bigger, and then ends up with kind of mistakes at its very core level, before you start thinking it out in more detail. So, um, definitely be, being quick is always relative to the project that you're working on. You may be given four years to work on something, at which point a fast design may actually be a process of two weeks, or your project needs to be shipped by February next year, and therefore a fast design needs to be pretty rapid. So we're talking about getting an idea up on a whiteboard, not even worrying about documenting it because it's already being worked on in the afternoon after you've done it, but you have to get to the the kind of core of what that idea is and why it's important for the game that you're making as soon as possible, because that can then give you the solid foundation to grow from. Does that answer it? Yeah. Cool. Any more questions? Okay. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I have a question regarding the user story, agent development, and the games, because probably as a designer you have some feature that you want to, I don't know, how especially player gonna jump, how the wheel's gonna turn, and et cetera. And what's happening, how you transform that to the user story and give somebody else to come up with that. So, so the initial part of a user story is essentially sowing the seeds of the idea. As a designer, I would like this to work like this so that this can happen. But then that needs to be clarified with the acceptance criteria that come with that. So what are the things that are going to make this the feature that I need it to be? And, and that's where the discussion happens with the, with the team. It, it's OK as a designer to designate what those acceptance criteria are but it's better to have that as a conversation because there may be limitations in the code base or, or whatever the limitations may be that mean that you're asking the impossible of someone. Um, whereas having that conversation means actually you can work through what is going to make this task a success by the end of it. But, but yeah, they are the guidelines by which that user story needs to be measured. If you don't have those, then you're essentially just creating a wish list and it's highly likely that the things that you need that character to do, for example, I need him to be able to jump. Okay, cool, I made a character that jumps, but it can't jump over the wall that's at the start of this first level. That's your first acceptance criteria. It must be able to clear this level of wall. So it's those details that, that get thrashed out in that meeting. Uh, they're the things that make a user story more than just this kind of whimsical, I need this to do this. But that's the high level pitch, right? You think of it as a design document, that's the high level, and then you're talking about the, the content and the minutiae of the detail later on. Okay. Thanks. Um, regarding user stories, I have a point. Uh, could you give us an example from one of the games you worked on for a user story? Because the way I've usually dealt with them is you have, uh, you're making a game, say it's a master game or something, and then you're making it for a certain audience. Mm -hmm. And back when I was at Ubisoft, we were making this game, which was, uh, have you guys seen the CSI Miami TV series? It's a show, have you guys seen that? Yes. So it's, yes. so when we said, <laughs> it's a great show. <laughs> uh, and we were making that, and uh, we were making a game for the mobile, for CSI crime mystery. Uh, and what we did was we ended up printing a picture of what the person who would play the game looked like on everybody's desk. It was an old lady knitting something for her grandchildren. 
on this old recliner watching CSI on our TV. So everybody, when they came in the morning, they would see that picture and they would be like, we are making this game for this person. Every single decision that we make, design decision that we make, is going to be tailored for that woman. And that's how we dealt with it. And I, I, think, I think to a certain limit, that's still how I look at it. Yeah, and that, that is a really useful thing. We did um, motivational posters uh, when we were working on Dirt Rally. We got our community to tell us what they loved about Rally, and then we'd make these motivational posters on the wall. Um, the sound of gravel, the sound of anti-lag, the, sa the smell of race fuel, which obviously is quite hard to represent in a, in a game. But all of these things kind of motivate you. To, to that point, I think with the user story there, you probably would have written the story as, as Doris, 69, in Alabama, who also enjoys knitting and kittens, um, <laughs> I want CSI, <laughs> I want this feature to do this thing because that's going to resonate well with me. Um, wh when I used to write user stories, because I was so close to the community, I, I sometimes would write the community member's name as a bit of a motivator for, like, Greg Flinchbout. As Greg Flinchbout, I want to hear the sound of gravel under the car. You won't believe it, but we were making a rally game, and you couldn't hear the stones hitting the underside of the car. It didn't sound like you were driving on... Uh, a loose surface, and it was the first thing I heard when I got into a rally car and competed for real was that it sounds like a shot blaster, like, like a machine gun's hitting the bottom of the car. So to bring that up in the audio mix and make sure that that was front and center because that was the thing that made our game sound different to all other racing games was hugely important. So that, I think, yeah, it's a, it, that's a good example of a user story where you actually channel the, the kind of mindset of the person who's playing it. Our user story was mostly, as an old woman, name. I want to feel like I want to feel as handsome as Ted Danson, and solve crime. <laughs> Any other questions? But before we close this, I have a question, and I feel like I can't, I can't let you walk if I don't ask this. Is okay. how the hell did you play driver? <laughs> Yeah, so try is, just just to give you some context. I had that game for a PS1 and this was 1998 or 99 uh, And back in those days if you bought a game you were gonna stick with it for a year There was no choice you wouldn't you wouldn't go to your phone and look at the app store and download another game So I had this game and I had to play it for a year and I couldn't get past the first mission, which was Here's a car You have to chase it and it had a head start of about 500 meters from you and I did that every day <laughs> for, about, for about three months before I decided I don't think PlayStation 1 was a good choice. That, that is retention right there. Um, yeah, so, so you did the car park. So, you, so the, the interesting thing about Driver is a lot of people failed at the car park, which was their tutorial. Because you had to do like this checklist of driving maneuvers and... It's like weave around the columns, do a handbrake turn, do a burnout. So it was like a super challenging tutorial. But th I think the notion of it was, if you can do that, you can play the rest of the game. So I, I don't think I've ever encountered someone that did that and then fell at the next hurdle. Just because to clarify, it took me a month to get past to, okay, the tutorials. Yeah. They were like, prove yourself for this game, and then you can play it. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's difficulty on its head. The only thing that was harder than that was the final mission, which was... It put you in a car that you'd never driven, uh, like in terms of weight. It turned the rain on, which you never had in the rest of the game. And then it sent you on this like ridiculous 45 minute cross town mission with the most angry police force of all time chasing you. And um, I, yeah, that took me about two weeks to complete that. And that was taking it in turns with a friend. And when we did it, we were just like, I think we may have snapped the disc and just gone with it. <laughs> Done. Never doing it again. But yeah, that, that, that's an example of game difficulty at its like, peak. That's where devs have got together, played the shit out of that game and gone, we can complete it. I'm sure it'll be fine for everyone else. It's like, no, no. It's super hard. So I guess the secret it, weapon was your friend. Um, yeah, always have a buddy. <laughs> No, it's just I uh, knew it. it was a gift of skill that I have that some people obviously don't. 
All right. All call me, ladies and gentlemen.